that it? I think so, yeah. Story. I think yeah. That's it makes that little un- twist. Okay, okay, okay. There's okay, an unbelievable okay. conflict with the crown, so that's interesting. This is this is true. This is true. Okay, enough. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks everyone for for joining uh, early. Um, you know, as I put out in the president's message, uh, we'll have this little chit chat session um, going forward. So, um, welcome to the Rotary Club of Norfolk. Uh, I ask that everyone please mute your phones. Uh, as you have a part in the meeting, I will invite you to unmute and, and we can go from there. Um, so uh, first off, we're going to be led in music by Pam Tubbs. Pam? And you're going to let me share my screen, I know. And yes. so here we go, share, and we will do this. I'm beginning. Ha ha. How's that look? That looks great. Can you see it? All right. So I have a helper here. And I think that, um, you know, we're going to sing that later. But first, we're going to sing Deck the Hall. So everybody knows this. I hope if you don't, then, um, you know, uh, just kind of um, fake it. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> while you're singing, unless you have some actual jingle bells. Look, Ace. We have actual jingle bells. So everybody ready?
Thank you, Pam. I have greetings for every group. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Pam, and 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 thank you to our percussionist. Yes. 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 Go Thanks, away. Ace. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so now, uh, do you want to continue? Continue. If you can, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation on God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And now if you can join me in the four-way test of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? And Bob? Will it be fun? All right. Thank you all. Um, and now our invocation from uh, Julie Kiesling. Today, let us be mindful of those who care for our health. Let us appeal to our creator to support all of the healthcare professionals in the world. They have had to witness so much death that their spirits must be overwhelmed. Although we believe that death is not an end, but a new beginning, we still feel saddened and abandoned. Help the healthcare pro professionals and us, oh Lord, not only to persevere, but to promote love. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Julie. Uh, and now our visitation report from Joe Massey. I don't have anything to report personally, but if anybody within hearing distance of this knows of someone in need of our attention, please pipe up. All right. Thank you very much. Um, you know, sometimes no news is good news, right, Joe? <laughs> we hope. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, introduction of guests. I looked around. I did not see any guests. I guess you could say we have a, a temporary guest with us. Um, we have Clay Dills, um, who is going to be inducted today. So for the first half of the meeting, he's a guest. And for the second half, uh, he will be a member. And, and Clay, welcome. Welcome to the Rotary Club. Thanks for having me. Not a problem at all. Not a problem at all. Um, our, our school of the week for the week is Lindenwood Elementary School, and our scribe for today is Walt Sobick. So um, please speak clearly, and uh, everyone will be able to uh, everyone will be able to hear you. Okay, um, let's see. Let's go ahead on to let's go on with the induction of Clay. Um, you know, this is always one of the one of the highlights. Jim, yes. Jim, for some reason, I'm seeing Ann Morgan's screen. That's it? Stop sharing yeah, Me screen. too. Oh, hold Ann on Morgan's. Oh, hold yeah, on. I am too. On. Hold on. You are. Ann, I love you, dear, but. <laughs> <laughs> Ann? Yes. What do I need to do? You just need to stop. Somehow you're sharing. And you just need to stop sharing. Okay, how do we stop sharing? Uh, Under share. Hold screen. on, hold on. I just stopped you sharing. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. here it goes. Everybody's back. Okay, sorry about I'm that. Um, no, that's okay. Okay, well, we recovered quickly on that one. Um, so, you know, one of the highlights uh, for a president is to see new members joining the club. <laughs> we are pleased uh, and thrilled to have. Um, Clay Dills joining our club. And without further ado, I would like to introduce um, his sponsor, Chris Bugs, who will um, tell us um, who will tell us a little bit about um, a little bit about Clay. So Chris. Uh, it, it's exciting to have Clay join the club because now there's someone newer than me. Um, <laughs> but uh, seriously, I've been Clay for a few years now. And he's a great a great addition to, to the whole Rotary um, family. He has an archi architecture firm in Virginia Beach. He's done a lot of amazing projects, and I, and I know you'll get to hear more about that as time goes on. 
Josh. Um, he he's has a, a great record of community service. I'm, I'm a Cox High School parent. Um, his firm did a really special um, outdoor venue there called the Falcon's Nest. Um, he's working with the Elizabeth River Project on, on an expansion. And then he has a first time he put together uh, a multidisciplinary um, design team uh, to, to do that project for him. So he, he, he went around and, and solicited, solicited that the, the engineering consultants and the other consultants needed to do this so that the Elizabeth River project could have an awesome addition to their Paradise Creek facility. Uh, it, his firm is a B Corp, is about to be certified as a B Corporation, which is a cool thing. Just a lot of a great record of service. His wife, Deidre, is super cool. Hopefully he'll, he'll bring her around sometime. She was really involved with the Cox Orchestra. My daughter is on, really appreciate that. His son, Eli, is um, remotely attending the Cooper Union, following in his dad's footsteps. And his um, younger son goes to school with um, my daughter at Cox, and he's about to start design school at, at Virginia Tech next year. You may find him skateboarding at a local strip mall up or down that Great Neck Corridor. Um, Clay's father was a Rotarian himself, so he is a, leg, a, a legacy or whatever we call that. Um, Clay, my only words of wisdom before I turn you over to your mentor is don't don't limit your rotary experience to this club. I mean, if 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 your rotary experience was limited to this club, you could still have an awesome experience. But uh, but rotary is even bigger than this awesome club, and, and so I wouldn't limit your rotary experience to just this club. And I think, Michael, you're next, right? Well, I have to say anything as his mentor. <laughs> well, you're supposed, to, you're supposed to, I mean, got to tell him about his pen and his badge. Yes. And, and you know. Got it. So, Clay, do you have your pen? <laughs> I actually don't have my pen with me. <laughs> Okay, well, Clay, that's your first fine because I because I know you received it. Um, I do. I had the full box, but I I was like running around town. I'm at my house right now. Okay, all right. Well, Michael, continue, but that'll cost you some money there, Clay. That's all right. <laughs> well, day one. Yeah, if we were in person, I would be pinning you or giving you your pin and a little folder of stuff to do. So uh, I suppose you skate free um, this time, but. Every Tuesday, you should be wearing it, or in general, when you're out and about, wear it. It just reminds you that you're Rotarian, and people ask, oh, you're in Rotary, and they always know somebody in Rotary, or it's a good way to start telling your Rotary story, so we'll let it go for today. Yeah. And then I'll be mentoring you on your Rotary journey. I have no idea what that means, so good luck. Yeah. Well, Clay, love, one, love. one of the things that that means, Clay and, and Michael, is that you're, you'll start as what we call a red badge member. And basically that means you're a full fledged member. And there, there are certain tasks that we ask you to do, mostly to familiarize yourself with the different aspects of Rotary. And you'll gradually work your way to being a, a blue badge member. And really what that means is that you've, you, you've learned a lot about the organization. You've learned about our club. You've, you've done certain things like a, attend another, um, another Rotary's meeting, you've attended a board meeting. Uh, but all of that will be in the, in, in the packet of information that, that you'll be receiving. But um, welcome to the Rotary Club of Norfolk. Um, Thank you. Do you have anything you wanna share right now? No, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, accepting me. Um, we're, you know, I always thought of Rotary as something my dad did because it was what he did almost through my entire youth. So I was, um, I, I sort of, this was very easy for me. Um, you know, a few years ago, we got very serious in the office about uh, formalizing how we do community service and trying to um, create the most good out of what we do. Um, so this is perfect timing for me um, and for our firm. So don't think it's just me. We'll rope everyone else into it. But, you know, you realize that um, you can affect some change by yourself or, you know, our firm alone, but you quickly realize that in a full community of people that with the same mission, same values, same 
um, speed, full speed ahead for community service, you get a whole lot more done. So I'm excited. Um, this, that's really what, what I'm here for. And it sounds, sounds like it's well underway. So thank you, Chris. Thank you, Michael, um, and everyone else. Well, welcome. Welcome. We, we're, we're, we're thrilled to have you in the club. Thanks. Um, while we're on the subject of new members, I just want to give everyone an alert in, in the president's message that will go out this week will be two more applications um, for you to take a look at. The board reviewed them last night at our board meeting, and um, we're sending two to the membership to review. Um, one is for uh, Jennifer Dilworth, and the other is for Stan Turbeville. So both of them have been at our meetings, uh, a couple of meetings over the last month uh, as visitors and are, have submitted applications and uh, the board again re uh, agreed to send that to the membership. We'll be voting on them at our first meeting in January, January 5th. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, we do have one Paul Harris fellow uh, to do, but I do, uh, but Lorna's not here. That's the only one we had, right, Sigur? Actually, we have several that are coming down the pike. We have, and now I'm going to really trip myself over because I'm not remembering, but we have, we have at least two, one of whom is um, Chris Bug. Okay. And... I'm forgetting who the other one is, but we also have two others who are going up another level in the Paul Harris fellow. So, you know, the, the last, um, the last day of giving was very successful for our club. And I'm sure that there are others that I haven't figured out yet. Okay. We'll okay. have multiple Paul Harris fellows in the near future. Awesome. That's great. That's great. And thank you to all members of the club for supporting the foundation. Um, that helps not only Rotary International worldwide, but also does come back and help us locally. Um, holiday social. We're going to have a holiday uh, Zoom uh, cocktail party, for lack of a better term, or social. And that's going to be on the 22nd, which is next Tuesday. We're keeping it simple by keeping it on a Tuesday. And that's going to start at 5.30. And it'll really just be... a, a an opportunity for us to gather in a social environment. Um, but you'll, you'll be getting some more information about that. Maybe we'll have some entertainment, um, you know, bring your favorite drink recipe, uh, alcoholic or not to share. And, um, and we'll just try to spend some time together. Um, okay, here's one thing that came up at yesterday's board meeting. Um, Carlisle was sitting pretty much like he is right now, if everyone can see Carlisle. And he was sipping this drink and we were like, what is that? And he went on about this three-year-old eggnog that he was drinking during the board meeting uh, and was, was very, very proud of it. Um, and then Lisa Chandler countered with her family's recipe um, and how good theirs was. So what I, what I convinced them both to do is we're gonna, we're gonna treat this a little bit like Shark Tank. Um, they're each gonna have 30 seconds to tell us why their recipe is so good. And then we're going to open bidding on a quart of each of their eggnog. So um, I'm going to, uh, being a gentleman, I'm going to defer and have Lisa Chandler uh, make her pitch to the club first. Lisa, you have the floor. So our family recipe is from Webb's side of the family and it's Uncle Franklin's eggnog. I think what makes uh, Uncle Franklin's eggnog so special is um, the three different kinds of alcohol that go into it. And then it's the love of about Oh, about five or six people that always want to be in on the eggnog making the night um, that we're doing it. So we usually make about um, four gallons of it and it usually doesn't last through. I've never tried keeping it for three years. I, I might have to try that 
and uh, but we usually get to um, just after New Year's and we are finished with it. It's very, it's, it's quite yummy. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Lisa. Um, Carlisle, your 30 seconds, make your pitch. Well, this is uh, my father's recipe and he, uh, I don't know where he got it from, but uh, it also includes three kinds of alcohol. But we age ours um, in the refrigerator. Uh, I have uh, a quart of two-year-old eggnog, which is what we're auctioning off today. Um, what I was drinking yesterday was three years old. And the only thing you really need to do with it, other than keep it refrigerated, is shake it two or three times a year, just so it doesn't separate. And, uh, and, and uh, it is, uh, again, like Lisa said, it's quite yummy. And the longer it ages, the smoother it gets. So if you, if you like uh, spiked eggnog, <laughs> this, I think you will like this. And should, uh, should the recipe ever get out, you can use your favorite brand of alcohol uh, to uh, spike it with. All right, thank you, Carlisle. So we're gonna start the auction by, uh, we're gonna start the auction first of Lisa Chandler's. Do I have an opening bid of $25? I have a question first. What kind of booze is in this nog? Is it rum or bourbon or what? It's a secret. Oh, well, <laughs> that has a big, um, uh, that, that kind of makes me want to, I'm a rum person, not a bourbon person. So that's important to me. Well, Pam, I'm, I, I think, I mean, for mine and probably Carlisle's, uh, if his has three, mine is rum, bourbon and brandy. Uh-huh. So okay. it, it should bid. appeal to just about anybody. Okay, first bid, 25. Okay, I got Pam at $25. I'll Jeff go 30. Wells. I'll go 30. 30 from Marty. 35. 35 from Sigur. 40. Four, from, just tell me 40 from who, because I can't see yeah. everyone's picture. Oh, sorry, 40 from Pam. 40 from Pam. Do I have 45, 45, 45, 45? I'll 45 bid 45. Joe. Who, who, Joe New? That's right. Joe New for 45. Do I have 50? 50, 50 from Jim, Jim O'Brien, 50. 50 from Jim O'Brien. Thank you, Jim. 55, 55. Do I hear 55? $55 for this three liquor family heritage eggnog. Do I have 55? 55. 55 from Pam. 55 from Pam. I heard six, someone. Six, 60 from Carlisle. 60 Ooh. from Carlisle. Ooh, he, wants to, like he. <laughs> he wants to compare them himself. <laughs> Do I have 65, 65, 65, 65 going once. 65. 65 Pam. from Pam. Okay. Thank you, Pam. Do I have 70? Anyone want to go 70? 70 on the Chandler recipe. This reminds me a little bit of the Waltons. <laughs> $70. Do I have $70? Okay, 65 going once, 65 going twice. Pam, you are the owner of the Chandler Secret Recipe. Thank you very much. Yay. Thank you, Pam. I'll get it to you before Christmas. Okay, sounds like a plan. All right, that was awesome. Okay, so now we have the secret recipe from Carlisle, although I did see him oddly enough nodding on the three liquor ingredients that were that were in his the secret family recipe um, so let's uh, let's open Carlisle's at twenty five dollars do I have twenty five dollars for for Carlisle's secret family recipe twenty five from John twenty five from John thank you John do I have 30 30 30 from Sigur. we have 30 from Sigur. do I have 35 35 40 from Joe new 40, Joe jumping up, 40 from Joe New. He wants it bad. Do I have 45, 45, 45, 45, 45 dollars for Carlisle's special recipe? Carlisle, you look so, you look so comfortable yesterday. I'm going to bid 50 for yours right now. 
<laughs> I, I want to share that comfort. Anyone, $55. $55. 55. 55. 55 from Jeff Wells. All right. Do I have 60? $60. Oh, 60 from Clay. 60 from the newbie. Oh, way Clay, to go. Killing me. Way, to, way to step up. Your fine is forgiven if you win. Um, do I, do I have That's 60? what I was hoping for. Okay, $65. $65 for the Roten family recipe. 65. Do I hear $65? 65. All right, 60 going once, 60 going twice. Clay, you are the proud owner. Welcome to the club. Okay, well, thank you. I hope this added a little bit of levity. It certainly did to our board meeting last night. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that money will be going to um, Norfolk Rotary Charities um, and helps us do good works uh, within the community. So, so thank you for everyone's participation and thanks for for indulging me in, in what I thought would be a little fun. Um, Clay, I'll get it to you as soon as I can figure out how to get in touch with you. Yeah, just, or I can come by and get it. Okay. Either way. <laughs> All good. All <laughs> thank good. you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. And, and thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Carlisle. That was wonderful of you. Um, final thing for just some club business to bring up is... Um, the Salvation Army Christmas Depot is this Thursday. Um, our shift that we are committed to goes from noon to five. Uh, it's in the Kempsville area. There's more information that is on, um, on the club website where you can register. Um, I ask you to consider it. Uh, I think it's a worthy cause that we've participated in for many years. Um, and uh, you know it's a it's a time where it's going to be a little bit different this year in that most of it is going to be outdoors and delivering to cars, um, but it still helps a lot of folks in our community. And uh, I know we are we tend to be late signer uppers and late arrivers, um, but but please give that some consideration. Uh, that, that that's really a wonderful cause. Um, okay, moving along. Our vice president in charge of programs is Lori Harrison, who due to some work conflicts was unable to be with us. Um, our Rotarian of the day is Marilyn Gowen. And um, Marilyn joined uh, Norfolk Rotary in 2017. She particularly enjoys meeting people who are not in medicine and enjoys the volunteer work. She enjoys art and her husband she enjoys art and her and her husband have a rather eclectic collection, may have been a fact leading to their older daughter now being an art conservator at the National Gallery. Marilyn, she might be a guest speaker someday. You never know. Cool. Um, she played the cornet and golf in school, no holes in one, has not been doing either of them since and now she plays the radio. So uh, I'm now, I'm now going to turn the meeting over to Marilyn, who will be introducing our guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you, President Jim. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Cynthia Romero uh, to the group. She is a uh, fellow in the American Academy of Family Practice, having uh, achieved her uh, training at EVMS in family medicine. Uh, she was previously the state health commissioner for Virginia, and she's currently the director of the Brock Institute for Community and Global Health at EVMS. In that role, she is working to improve the health of all people in Hampton Roads through collaborative educational clinical care and research activities. Uh, three priority areas for the Brock Institute are mental health and substance abuse, maternal child health, and health disparities. I'm pleased that she'll be able to speak to us today on COVID-19 and the future community impact of the disease. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Romero. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of Dr. Richard Homan, our president, provost, and dean at EVMS, all of our faculty, staff, and students, 
want to bring greetings uh, to all of you. And I tell you, this is the most fun I've had, um, I can truly say, for the past week. So thank you for allowing me to be part of this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gowen, for that very kind introduction. And I also want to thank uh, Lori Harrison uh, for the extension or the invitation to join you today. I am sharing my screen here. Just want to make sure you all can see this. We can see. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to applaud and thank uh, Jim Kitts and the um, officers and members of the Rotary Club of Norfolk for your leadership, um, in particular during this crisis. And I want to thank you for uh, supporting the purchase of masks for our students, keeping them safe. I want to thank you for writing very special appreciation and support notes for our residents and fellows, our training uh, residents and fellows and for helping spread the, the critical message of the 757 Mask Up campaign um, on your Facebook page. So thank you so much for that wonderful support. In the brief time that I have with you, um, I wanna talk about the uh, mental health impacts in particular from COVID-19 and appreciate the opportunity to uh, discuss this. Uh, and I also shared my presentation with uh, Lori, so if you would like to get a copy of it, as well as a, a resource that I'm going to share, uh, Lori will be able to share that with you. So when we look now that we are in the ninth month of this pandemic, looking back, it seems just like yesterday uh, that the first case was reported in March of this year. And you could see the timeline of where we had our governor appropriately uh, declaring the state of emergency and then implementing several other executive orders. Then in the May timeframe, we saw the first peak throughout our Commonwealth for the number of hospitalizations within one day, total hospitalizations across the Commonwealth, the number of deaths within a day and the number of positive COVID cases in a day. Within our region, it actually took um, a few more weeks to July and August for us to have the peak numbers within our region. And our region is considered from uh, Williamsburg, Matthews County, all the way to the Eastern Shore and even Franklin. And then you see September is when we started to see a little bit um, higher peak as well. Where we are today, again, latest information is from December 13th. We are seeing that we are continuing to increase across the Commonwealth in terms of the number of hospitalizations and definitely in the Eastern region for the hospitalization and the number of cases. Fortunately, the deaths across Virginia and in our region are going down. But again, we're in that early phase of a potential um, upgoing peak. But as of today, these are the numbers that you see the total number of cases across our Commonwealth, over 285,000. Total hospitalizations thus far, over 16,000. Total of deaths, over 4,400. And again, as of December 13th, the Eastern region had no deaths. How has COVID-19 impacted all of us? I'm confident that all of you have seen how it has impacted businesses and livelihoods across the spectrum. Economic disruption, several you know, businesses and in particular industries have suffered because of closures and seen significant numbers of unemployment, not just in our region, but across the Commonwealth, across the country. The recovery for all of those sectors has been quite daunting, but fortunately with the leadership of many of our businesses, nonprofits, educational institutions, we are seeing that there has been slow recovery, but it still is quite daunting overall. When we look at the impact on our lives, within our individual lives, within our family, certainly within our community, and certainly within our business networks, we're seeing that there really is a loss of human support, human connections and human relationships. And certainly with the changes in routines at all levels, we're seeing that that is impacting our social and emotional health. When we look at food systems in particular and how it's been disrupted across the world, across our country, across our Commonwealth and across our region, we're seeing that that has impacted you know, how people act and how they are functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. Many people, families, communities that had never even considered being unemployed and wondering where their next meal would come from are finding themselves trying to seek food from family and friends, 
or even going to pantries or the food bank. And when we see the impact from that, we're seeing that especially families who do not have resources, we're seeing that nutrition is a significant issue where not only are they not getting food in many cases, continuing to go hungry, but those that have access to some foods and the least expensive foods are oftentimes the less nutritious food. And then we're certainly see the impacts on health and healthcare services. So when we see that the pandemic really caused people to stay at home and really were being advised to not be exposed and not come to the emergency department or to physician offices, we know that that has disrupted the health and well being of many people, especially children. But when we also see that the shift went to the platforms and the virtual encounters, we know that there are people who don't have access to internet, don't have access to the devices that they need, or simply don't have access to the IT technology to be able to foster those virtual interactions. And then when we see that people are less active because they're sitting in front of virtual screens and having meetings all days and not running around to different you know, buildings or parking lots, et cetera, we are seeing the weight gain. So we're hearing instead of the freshman 15 that people were gaining in college, we're now considering the COVID-19. And so with where we are now, we're right in the middle of the pandemic and we are you know, seeing some hope, especially with the vaccines that we know came to the United States yesterday and really are starting to spread, especially to that first tier of essential workers, there is mm -hmm. still ongoing un uncertainty. And then considering within our country and in our society that we are still dealing with so many other um, situations that are causing additional uncertainty, anxiety, and stress. And those are, as you see there, racial injustice, the political polarization, the onslaught of, of constant news and oftentimes news is not always the most positive news, but again, compounding you know, all the other circumstances in our society. So when we look forward, okay, we all like to be optimistic and know that the path is forward and it'll have some curves here and there, but we ultimately know that we will get to a peak, get to the top of a mountain and be able to look back and hopefully learn from lessons that we are seeing today. But certainly from as a health professional, I am seeing that there are concerns that we need to look right at our feet today and recognize and acknowledge that there are potholes that exist. And if we are not paying attention, especially related to health and mental health of everyone, that there are gonna be challenges in our path moving forward and for years to come. So we know that there are recovery efforts that are taking place specifically in our region under the guise of seven, Recovery 757 that are focused on rebuilding the economy. Definitely an essential priority. Yet we also need to consider the critical importance of focusing on supporting the workforce. And that's the current workforce as well as the future workforce. And those who are not in uh, jobs today, how can we take advantage of supporting them, maybe providing them some skills, especially in, um, in strategies and, um, and, and in specific positions that we know are gonna be in demand in the future. So we need to focus on the health, especially the mental health of the current and future workforce, because we know it is the health of the workforce that is critical to maintaining the vitality of our economy, especially here in Hampton Roads. So when we consider the health and wellness of individuals, families, and communities, we want to pause and actually reflect on what are the different factors that affect health. Now, of course, we're here in Hampton Roads and at the medical school, which is your health care workforce generator for the region, producing physicians, uh, surgical assistants, physician assistants, and other healthcare professionals. We like to think that clinical care, seeing physician, being part of the healthcare delivery, taking medications, getting exams, is, is going to keep you healthy and well and extend your life, which is true. Yet when we look at this beautiful depiction that was provided by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, we know that the science also tells us that there are so many other factors, in fact, other factors that contribute to health and wellness or premature death more than just clinical care and even genetics alone. So when we look at those other factors, those are considered and lumped into 
the social determinant of health. But let's focus first on health behaviors that comprise about 30% of the other factors beyond clinical care. So we know that there are certain behaviors that will lead to a better quality of life, better health outcomes, and prolonged life. So what are those health behaviors? Of course, eating lots of fruits and vegetables. That includes physical activity and exercise. That includes reducing your stress. Those are activities that if we do them, again, will improve our health and prolong our life. But we also know that not doing those activities and not doing those behaviors could lead to poor quality of life, poor health outcomes, and premature death. Likewise, there are behaviors that could lead to premature death. The most common, of course, is substance use, such as uh, cigarettes or alcohol or opioids. So we also know that avoiding those can actually improve our quality of life and prolong our, um, our existence. But we see that there's another category of factors that impact health and wellness and can determine if someone will live longer or someone will have premature death. And those are the socioeconomic factors. In particular, educational attainment and income level. So we know that people who have attained education higher than high school or even college or postgraduate and have higher income levels tend to have better health outcomes. Conversely, those who have lower educational attainment and lower incomes tend to have poorer health outcomes. Now, is that fair? Is that right? It is the fact at this time, yet we know that if we have this information, it can arm us with looking at strategies to address that. But then we also cannot forget the physical environment where people live, learn, work, play, and worship. If they're not safe, if they're not healthy, if they don't have a place to walk or to exercise, a green space for them to enjoy being outside, if they don't have healthy air to breathe, or clean water to drink, their health will be impacted and their lifespan will be shortened. Likewise, if there is violence, whether it's around the community or within a home, emotional or physical violence, we know that that's gonna impact an individual and family's health. And this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Many of you may have seen this before, but it's basically a construct or framework that defines why people behave or why they are motivated to act the way they do. And when we particularly look at the base, that we know that people, families, and communities are driven to do what they need to do, especially to meet primarily their physiologic needs. Again, they're gonna be motivated to do something if it's gonna assure that they will have fresh food to eat, fresh water to drink, a, a stable home and safe home to be in, Yet we know that when individuals, families or communities are not able to meet those needs, that they're not gonna have the time to process and progress through those other stages that ultimately could lead to their overall health and wellness and achieving their professional and personal potential. But we also know that if individuals, families and communities are constantly in a state of seeking and trying to find and meet their physiologic needs, that those are the individuals most at risk for mental illness. And likewise, we're seeing that within the pandemic. So how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted mental health in particular? Well, we know the policies that were intended to mitigate the virus actually led to mental health concerns. So the shelter at home, being safe and minimizing exposure, of course, led to loneliness and isolation the social and physical distancing, not only within an environment, but just being safe at home, led to social disconnection and losing social supports. The remote working and learning has led to that you know, disruption of what we depend on, that human to human con you know, connection. It led to new routines that cause anxiety and stress, and certainly the ongoing economic challenges lead to uncertainty anxiety and depression. When we look at the website of Mental Health America, we see that since the pandemic, the number of people accessing the online screening program 
increased significantly. Since January through September, over 315,000 people took the online screening program and actually led them down the path of having anxiety. Over 535,000 took the survey and led them down the diagnosis or the consideration of depression. And within those categories, eight in 10 people who took those surveys actually already have symptoms that are consistent with moderate to severe disease. When we look at the, um, those who completed the survey also, we see that consistently, again, in both of those categories, anxiety and depression, that 70% of them reported that loneliness and isolation were at least the top three contributing factors for why they were really concerned about their mental health and well being. And when we specifically look at which population is suffering the most, it breaks our heart to see this that it's the young, young people, the youth, the 11 to 17 year olds, especially those who are suffering, you know, with their identification with LGBTQ plus issues. They're searching for help and support for the mental health. And again, they had survey results that were reflecting already moderate to severe symptoms of anxiety and depression. And we have to acknowledge that racism and mental health are, are interlocked. We know that people of color and those who are marginalized, whether it's because of race or ethnicity, because of being homeless, because of being physically disabled, they are individuals, communities, and families that experience life differently. And we know that when they are victims of that racism, that they are suffering from mental health issues deeper and more prominently than others. And we know that racism causes trauma and trauma leads to mental illness. And if it's not addressed, it will continue to plague these individuals, families and communities for a lifetime. So when we look at health disparities, especially in COVID-19, I'm actually gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment so I can show you some, some information directly from the Virginia Department of Health. And let me just pull that up real quickly here. And if you have not had a chance to look at the uh, website of the Virginia Department of Health, I urge you to spend some time there. And not just because I was over this agency before, but because the staff that collect this information and are so diligent about sharing it really reveals a lot of information that all of us could benefit from just knowing. So when we look at this particular graph, it's under the, uh, the summary dashboard. This is information that reflects the number of cases, hospitalizations, and death. And the beauty of this is that we could drill down to the specific health district. So let's pick Norfolk, which is of course right where we are. And when we look down here, it's a side-by-side -side comparison with this particular health district, which is Norfolk, and compared to the overall Commonwealth figures. So again, we're looking at the number of cases that are happening in Norfolk, and this is updated as of the 13th. And when we specifically look, oh, I'm sorry, it, let me go back and switch it back to Norfolk, I apologize. But this is just so much fun. I tell you, I could spend hours on this website. But again, when we're looking at the specific number of cases in Norfolk, just the number of cases, look at the difference between the black community and the white community in Norfolk and then compared to the distribution across the Commonwealth of Virginia. When we, and we see this, we see that there's a gap, there's a disparity, yet there is an opportunity for us to do something about that. When we switch to the number of hospitalizations, again, this is in Norfolk, look at this difference between the black community and white, and again, Difference here in Norfolk, when there's a difference, disparity, gap, opportunity, and look at the, compared to the distribution across the Commonwealth. Then when we look at the number of deaths, again, in Norfolk, and we break it down, look at, again, the difference between the black versus the white in Norfolk, and then difference even compared to the rest of the Commonwealth. So when we see this information, again, this is information that's collected and monitored this gives us a chance, number one, to just realize that something's happening and we need to ask why. And number two, we need to figure out what we can do differently 
today to address these individuals that are suffering, but also make the system changes that we need to moving forward so we prevent this and eliminate this from happening from the next time for the next pandemic or for any other tragedy that impacts our area. So let me go back to my presentation. Thank you. So again, where, where we are, where we are is still in the, a case of uh, mitigating since we see the numbers increasing across Virginia, across Hampton Roads and certainly across the world. So we need to continue to be vigilant. We also need to start protecting each other, do what we need to do, as I know all of you have been doing, doing the mitigation strategies and also getting the flu vaccine. This is a time where respiratory illnesses are impacting all of us and com combined with the risk factors that could lead to uh, catching COVID-19, we need to do the best we can to protect each other and certainly protect ourselves. We need to uh, be willing and also um, able to pay attention to people who are suffering, whether they're within our family, our friends, our network of coworkers and within the community. All those statistics that I, sh I shared with you from the Mental Health America, they're just not others. These are people who are within our family. They're in our community. They're in our networks. So we need to be aware of who those individuals are and be willing to help support them. We need to acknowledge that we are all going through COVID-19, but we are all going through COVID-19 differently. And we need to consider, especially those populations before the pandemic who were already in fragile support systems, they're likely suffering even more and certainly the data from the Virginia Department of Health reflect that they're likely the ones suffering the most from this pandemic. And we have to also learn from the prior pandemics that there are gonna be everlasting effects, especially not just on family relationships, but also on the mental health of several populations. We know especially that the essential workers, both healthcare, Po, you know, the uh, police officers, you know, everyone who has been at the front line of this pandemic and even the leadership that's been dealing with recovery are gonna be dealing with post-traumatic stress, anxiety and depression. And it'll take a long time for businesses to recover financially. So we also need to remember that in order for us to be prepared to address these, we need to take care of ourselves as well. The Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services provides this very nice statement cloud to allow us to remember what we could do to cope. Interesting thing of just focusing on what we know we can control, looking for what's good around us and within us and to be grateful for that and trying to spend time outside and appreciating nature. The Eastern Shore Healthy Communities provides these great seven keys to resiliency to take care of ourselves, maintain a schedule, leverage and build and enhance our social supports, being flexible, thinking positively, actively coping with and addressing stress and thinking about reflecting on our own personal purpose, what we believe in and what we can do. Now is the time to do this. And the more that we can help build our resiliency, the more we can help others that we want to help build theirs. And when it comes to accessing resources, these resources are all around us. This is a Mentally Healthy Norfolk. It's a pocket-sized brochure that the Brock Institute helped prepare in partnership with the city of Norfolk's Mentally Healthy Norfolk effort. This was an effort uh, launched by the city a couple of years ago, and it was intended to raise the awareness and to prevent suicide in Norfolk. And uh, when, when uh, Lori is able to share this with you, it's a printout, and once you print it out, it could actually be two copies of this uh, double-sided and you could cut it and actually put it in your pocket or let others put it in their pockets so access um, is available. Um, at the beginning of this pandemic in March, the Brock Institute staff actually called every number to assure that these resources were active and live. Resources 757 is a tremendous resource for our region and particularly focuses on supporting children and families who are homeless. So tremendous resources there and then the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Wonderful group of individuals, of people who've suffered from mental illness themselves, 
or who've helped work with a family member or as a caregiver for those suffering from mental illness. Warm hop hotline, so you can actually speak to a person. And again, those are the uh, hours that it's available. But again, reaching out to NAMI, uh, you will always reach a, uh, a live person. And recognizing that our veterans, there are 20 veterans that commit suicide every day across our country. And recognizing that Virginia and particularly Hampton Roads are some of the highest areas of concentration for veterans and recognizing that the military and their families as they're transitioning to veteran status are at higher risk for mental illness. And if we as a region, as we as healthcare supports and we as just family and friends um, are sensitive to those cultures and to their risk factors, then hopefully we can be paying attention and allowing them to get the support, especially the mental health supports that they deserve and certainly the benefits that they deserve. Additional resources, certainly primary care physician office, city specific agencies, definitely private and uh, public school systems have supports, especially for children, but also for families, faith-based organizations, and certainly families and friends. So what can all of us do? What can all of you do individually as a Rotary Club to help address, prepare, for this health and mental health crisis that we know is ongoing and that is likely to continue in the near and distant future. Again, hopefully from my conversation with you today that you'll see that you know, a simple text, a simple phone call, a simple smile can really go a long way. And again, simply, this is our time during a pandemic where we are hopefully appreciating all the blessings that we have. And again, with the, with the wonderful socialization and all the business that you did before I had a chance to speak, I know that you all are probably ahead of the curve in terms of being supported and being willing to help others. But I would hope that we can continue to spread the Rotary's message, continue to spread the message that everyone will get through it. We will get through this as long as we you know, kind of lock, lock arms together, share our resources and continue to be the change that we wish to see in this world. Thank you so much. I'll end there and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Roma, uh, Romero. Um, do we have any questions for Dr. Romero? I have, I, I have one that was sent to me uh, to ask you and it, it's, it's, um, it's not necessarily mental health related, but yeah. uh, if we expect to get a COVID vaccine soon, should we still get a flu shot now? Yes, uh, we are likely not going to have the uh, COVID-19 vaccine disseminated to the community at large. So the recommendations now are to try to get your flu shot now, especially if you've not had any reaction to the flu shot previously. So the, um, there are gonna be ongoing studies now that look at the timing between the flu vaccine and the COVID-19 vaccine. But as of now, it is considered safe to actually get the flu vaccine especially if you've tolerated it before. And again, the sooner, the better. But I would also say that as you are connecting and hopefully have access to uh, the COVID-19 vaccine, especially if you're in the essential worker category, again, taking the time to allow your body to specifically react to the flu vaccine and waiting, they're, they're saying anywhere between two to four weeks to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Again, hopefully you'll be able to tell if you're not having a fever, if you're not having any other uh, risk factors at the time that you're considering the COVID-19, if you are your healthy uh, status, then you should be able to tolerate the COVID-19 vaccine. But this is all very new. We are still learning a lot about the vaccine itself. There still need to be additional studies, particularly about the safety and effectiveness within pregnant women, within the pediatric population, within some others who have chronic illnesses. So this really is kind of an emergency but we're, we're, we're learning as we go. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Romero? Yes, Barbara. I would just like to thank you for, I mean, incredibly comprehensive um, report on where we are and what we've been through and uplifting. Um, you know, I guess the biggest message is to get out and touch each other any way we can via phone or text or however, but um, thank you very much for everything you included. Um, something that I have noticed recently is just, um, unfortunately, I was in a car accident. And after coming back from that and going through the rental car situation, 
they're just bombarded with people renting cars because of accidents as replacement vehicles. And I don't know who tracks the accident rate in the region, but it just my own observations, the number of people going through stop signs and stop lights and speeding um, and driving in a heightened state of anxiety has made it more dangerous to drive. So I would encourage all of my friends here to drive defensively as much as possible and be aware of everybody out on the road because um, it's just an interesting world out there on the road these days. Um, but thank you, Dr. Romero, that was wonderful. You're welcome, Barbara, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, this is Bill Eisenbleis. Yes. Uh, she was suggesting that people get the, the regular flu shot um, many of our members probably are aware of this, but if you're 65 or older, uh, you could go to CVS, get the flu shot, Medicare pays for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think that's true of most um, health plans also, employer okay. health plans. Agreed. Yeah. Dr. Romero, Bob Bancher with Prime Plus, and I want to thank you for a tremendous presentation. Uh, we've been frontline with seniors 15 and above for many, many years. And I got to say the last nine months has been a journey. Um, and your comment about reaching out and the use of technology, we're working actually with EVMS and Westminster Canterbury and Birdsong um, in bringing programming to seniors, but recognizing that it's like the tree in the forest. If they don't know how to use the technology, they're not going to get the programming. So uh, we're looking for volunteer counselors. In fact, some of the students are, are engaged that through Madeline. Um, and it's a tremendous program, but my appeal is to the whole Rotary Club mm -hmm. that as we witness in our first 15 minutes of social, people have become masters of signing on to Zoom. And I wanna challenge everybody in the club to find a senior and teach them how to use Zoom. Because with uh, telehealth and these are new opportunities for reaching out and for that senior that is reluctant to move their laptop from a coffee tray back into a laptop, we've got to, we've got to, so thank you for your presentation. It was right on the money. Great. Thank you so much, Bob. And I underscore that, you know, everything's changed in terms of what's going to happen six months from now when everything's hopefully back to normal, right? And we're, we're anticipating that telehealth, telemedicine, because of the efficiencies and because of safety, that it's gonna to continue to be a component of how we function in healthcare and in other um, you know, venues. So I, I appreciate your challenge and uh, willingness to help support others. But I would also say not just the seniors, but there are others, especially those who don't have resources now that are probably in the dark as well about not knowing how to access or, or how to troubleshoot if something doesn't connect. So it, you're right, sharing your expertise the fact that you all have been able to navigate so easily now, you're, you're, you're true experts. So again, just pay attention to people who are at the grocery store that you could tell they're struggling trying to find you know, a certain app. Again, a friendly voice, a friendly uh, helping hand. That's what the Rotary is all about. Yeah. Thank you. Any other, any other questions? Okay. Well, hold on. Did we have one? Okay. Um, Dr. Romero, in, in honor of your visit with us, uh, one of the things that we do is because we are so committed to literacy, especially childhood literacy, uh, we will be donating a book in your honor uh, to uh, Lindenwood Elementary School. So uh, in the future, if you're ever there, hop in their library after we get a chance to deliver it and they'll, there will be a book in your honor. Um, that, and, is, and, uh, that is fantastic, Jim. Thank you so much. I was hoping to get a swig of one of the eggnogs, but uh, next time maybe. Uh, with that, um, I, I, I like your attitude. <laughs> <laughs> um, real quick, uh, Barb Lipskis has something she wants to just share with us. Oh, um, I just wanted to share with you that um, Gus Stolreyer had experienced an episode of fainting while he was visiting his grandchildren in Richmond. Um, he is at... Um, VCU, um, or I'm sorry, at MCV, and um, doing well and expected to come home soon. He wanted to get transported home, but they wouldn't let him go. And we know that he is with um, a good group of physicians over there. But uh, Janet and Gus asked that you keep him in, his, in your prayers and uh, hope for his quick recovery and return to us. Okay. 
thank you also. Thank you for that. And I, I was negligent and we did not do happy fine or happy bucks or or fines this week. Uh, I know all the Naval Academy graduates are very happy about that out there. Um, I'm sorry for the Virginia Tech Hokies who really wanted to rub it into our Cavaliers, um, but we'll uh, we'll address this uh, we'll address this at the next meeting. Uh, just so you all know, uh, our next meeting is not until January 5th. Uh, I wish a a very happy holiday season to all of you. Uh, keep an eye out for the Zoom invite information uh, for our uh, our virtual get together on the 22nd. Um, thank you, um, thank you, Dr. Romero. It really was a wonderful presentation. Thank you all for joining, um, and uh, and hope to see you all soon. And I send my best regards from Berhanu Mengistu. He his neighbor just committed suicide, so he couldn't be on our, oh. our, our talk today. So. Oh. Oh. oh, that's awful. That is Keep awful. Keep him in your prayers, too. Thank we you. will. Well, thank you, and we are adjourned, and welcome, Clay. <laughs>